On this episode of NorCal News Now, we're speaking with conservative U.S. Senate candidate Aaron Cruz. I'm your host, Mike Richmond. And I'm political consultant Aaron Hart. Yes, you are, my man. How are you doing today? Doing all right. Good. Good to see you here in uh, spring, early spring. We're getting my tan on already. At work. You are. Yes. Yeah, I can tell you're, you're, you're out there doing it. Yes. Good, good for you. All right. Well, our guest on today's show is an author, an activist, and a speaker who is pursuing a U.S. Senate seat here in California. Aaron Cruz, welcome to NorCal News Now. Thank you for having me on. It's our pleasure. We were chatting before that you uh, you like working with uh, the local media, the podcasts and such. So we should be right up your alley. Thank you for giving uh, giving us a little bit of your time today. Of course, it's it's our pleasure. Well, let's start uh, with your your recently released book. So it, it's Revolution America: Communication Toolbox for the Modern Conservative American Woman. Correct. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, now, it's interesting to me that you're specifically calling out um, communication there in your subhead. So what are the messages that you think conservatives, especially women conservatives, uh, need to communicate better? Well, the book, Revolution America, is about us being the revolution. We are the revolution here in the United States of America and specifically where we live, California. And what I've seen, of course, I am a woman. What I've seen with women is that we as conservatives, sometimes we're quiet, we're reserved. And as we also notice, there are, there are loud groups, uh, mainly progressive left who, you know, get a lot of the media attention uh, and notice and notoriety in the press and otherwise and conservative voices are rarely heard. So what I really wanted to do was to help women be more effective communicators, and specifically conservative women. Uh, I believe that when we communicate, and we uh, communicate more clearly in our home, in our community, uh, and throughout the state, we will make an impact uh, that will further the conservative cause, and that's what's most important to me. And how do you, I mean, how do you actually make that happen? I mean, obviously there's organizational things that go into that, running for office as you're doing, um, but how do you begin to rally people that are either that are like-minded or maybe people that, that hold different perspectives on the political uh, viewpoint? How do, you, how do you rally those people to, to listen to what you have to say and to help kind of share your wisdom? Well, you know, women, conservative women in particular, I believe are seeing that that other women who might be a little bit more liberal minded or uh, have different varying views might be posing conflicts and relationships uh, and making that communication a bit rough. And so when I talk to other ladies, basically there's a cry out there. How can we better get along? How can I make my children, you know, live in a better space where at school they're not coming into different struggles and, and kind of alleviating the conflict, if you will. And so what I believe that I've done is, is be able to have that conversation. And, and conversation is obviously very important in communication. So uh, with women, with conservatives, I believe it's been really easy to tap into what's going to better our cause and help them be more effective communicators. And rallying around conservatism isn't hard for conservatives. What's difficult is changing the way we think, changing the way we approach others, changing the way we look at maybe ourselves and how we're relating to others, how we're relating to our children, our husbands, uh, our community uh, activists, networks. Uh, ladies groups and what have you, uh, changing behaviors is what comes a little bit more hard. So, uh, you know, basically what I do in the book is I help women work through those different issues by evaluating the way they think, the way they approach different situations, and adjusting the way they look at themselves and, and the way they look at the world, and, and taking it step by step, and then it, it ripples out from there. So it's, it's been a great experience working with women and, and helping them realize their potential. And from that, you know, if I, I always came out of this space of writing this book and, and seeking God's work and what he wants for my life as if I can impact one woman and she can impact one woman and, and, it, and it ripples out from there, that's all that matters. And, uh, and, and of course it's done much, much more than that for our communities, but. I, I had a funny story actually is uh, 
I, a friend of mine, she she works with in an office with some mm-hmm. people, and you know, it was it's it's in Kansas. It's in a rural rural place. Well, Lawrence, Kansas, so it's kind of a little pocket of Kansas. Mm-hmm. But they were going to the office for eight years, and and um, you know, kind of they they were big Obama fans, um, and and one Anything woman, for, as you know, yeah, one woman who they thought the whole time for eight years was an Obama fan. Um, Finally, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, kind of came out and said, you know what? We dealt with your president for eight mm-hmm. years and now now we have ours. So, you know, kind of, wow, they never knew there was eight years of tension <laughs> at the office. Uh, and right. so, I mean, it kind of relates to what your book is, I guess, about kind of having a message and, and being able to work out situations like that. And um, Communicating with others, you know, sometimes people get so wrapped up in their own mind and in their own world, they they forget that they're interacting with other people and impacting other individuals. Uh, and, And in the case of your friend, it sounds like everyone around her didn't realize what their environment from their viewpoint was doing to those around them who maybe didn't agree or lived in a different space or lived and had different principles and, and ideas about how how the country should operate. And suddenly now she sounds like she's expressing very truthfully that, well, now we're in a different space. We've got we have President Donald Trump and it's my turn to be able to talk very positively. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, I, I believe that we have to have these conversations. One of the reasons why we have divide is because of the inability for for both sides to be able to communicate and it's important to just keep trying and working on that yeah yeah so let's uh i, I like it because we're both named aaron so we we've got something well, right off the she, bat she's an aaron you're an aaron let's eh, see. come on <laughs> <laughs> let's tomato, see. tomato 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 <laughs> okay so uh, you just came back from the convention uh, in san diego uh it was one. yeah how uh, how was it give us the scoop Give us something maybe we haven't heard on the news. Like, you know, was there any rabble rousing down there? Uh, but more, more, more seriously, did did there was? I guess there wasn't an endorsement for governor. Uh, I'm not sure if there was one for senator. I, I don't know. Um, but um, well, here's the deal. So it, many many people know Diane Feinstein and Kevin DeLeon. The Democrat National Convention did not endorse a senator, yep. uh, a senator uh, candidate. Now, here's the deal: is that in their, in the case of the Democrat Party, they will not endorse unless they have two thirds quorum from the delegation. And in the case of the uh, Republican Party, that's the same situation there. So, you know, with the gubernatorial race, where we saw that. Uh, John Cox came up against Travis Allen. Uh, there was not a two-thirds majority vote for one candidate or the other. And so as a result of this, uh, there wasn't an endorsement put forth. And I do believe it, it may be the smartest action on the part of the Republican Party in that when the party is split that way, where you have a, a pretty close race, you know, it is it is important for the people to be able to determine who they would like to support. Uh, you know, it's it's important. Uh, also, I've heard you know the flip side to that. Many individuals are complaining that there is not a gubernatorial candidate being endorsed by the Republican Party, and so how are we as a people out here if the delegation can't come to a consensus? How are the people out here going to then come to a consensus? And well, it, that's just part of it. Is mm-hmm. you know, it's pro. It's all about process, and it's important to. Re- that process and for those people who are complaining and complaining and complaining what I would suggest would be especially if you you are complaining outside of California that's one thing if you're complaining inside of California and you are a US citizen here in the state of California get involved in the process become a delegate and and be a part of the solution that would be my suggestion there you go yeah and I I agree with you, you gotta let the process play out and that's that's the democracy that's been set up and you know let the voters and decide like the get involved in the game and maybe change them mm-hmm. yeah and I think it'll help with turnout for the Republicans so I I mean I mean I, right. there's there are a lot of upshots to and it. it's because of the candidates you have two very different candidates and you know um, 
you know, one's one's popular and one's coming on as a populist. So, you know, um, it'll be an interesting race there. That's an interesting one to watch. Well, it's I mean, and Aaron, I'm sure you would agree wherever you, you come down the political spectrum. I mean, people's voices really should be heard. I mean, you know, the, the more choice that people have and the more ability that voters constituents have to weigh in. And, and align themselves with candidates, I think is a good thing. I mean, there's been some controversy about winnowing down. I mean, of course, uh, California has a kind of an odd primary system where it's the, that final two. Uh, right. But, right. But, no, it, that, is, that is true. Uh, but in the case of, for example, the gubernatorial race, you have two individuals who came up pretty close to one another. And if they had started hammering down on it and they had done a revote, you know, the, the the decision was made to do a revote, and they just hammered it and hammered it and hammered it, and they ended up with somebody they can endorse. Would it have been the right process? I don't know. You know, the 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 money that's behind the California Republican the Re- California Republican Party endorsement it's a lot of funding, and to give a kind of a bullied bolster, if you will, to one candidate over the other when you have such an important race, such a close race as far as the delegates were concerned. I really think it's important that that money just not be thrown out there improperly or you know hastily and let the people decide. You know, um, it's it's important. Now, we saw with Judge Bailey, and I'm not sure if you followed very closely, but with Judge Bailey's race um, in with the delegation, they did go for that second vote. They ended up getting Judge Bailey to the place where um, they revoted and he came out on top, uh, and they did move forward with the endorsement. Uh, you know, it happens, but that gubernatorial race is so vital for the state. I I, I don't know. I, I'm glad that they moved forward in the way they did. Have you? Uh, and do you mind telling us who you you endorse in that gubernatorial race? In the gubernatorial race, I'll be very specific with you. Uh, I I support my constituents. I'm running for United States Senate in the state of California. I myself am a am a, am a conservative. I want to win against the Democrats and the progressives, uh, the progressive Democrats uh, and Gavin Newsom. Now, Judge, uh, not Judge Bailey, um, John Cox, okay, I support those people who support John Cox. They're my voters. They're, they would be my constituents. And if they back him, then I back them. And the same goes for Travis Allen. But keeping in mind on my position I did endorse Travis Allen back in January Uh, I believe he is the strongest candidate he aligns well with the principles set forth by the CRA and and the Republican Party he has a as we've just seen come out he has a 99% approval for votes in the state assembly Uh, and he's a strong candidate he has a strong voting record and I believe he also knows the parties, he knows the players, he knows the people up there in Sacramento who have been bleeding that system dry, and he'll be best to advocate for Californians and get the job done. Now, will John Cox not be, you know, be any less successful? I don't know. He has run for many offices. He is a very smart man. We know he's done well in business. He's he's an extremely accomplished person. He's doing well in his race. He, of course, would be much better than Gavin Newsom. So, you know, I just do believe very firmly that Travis Allen is the strongest candidate. Aaron, let, let's turn to immigration. Um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but as I understand your position, you're, you certainly are in favor of, of ending DACA. Um, so can you explain your position in terms of amnesty for those that would, or lack of amnesty for those that would fall kind of in that gap, people that have been here for many years and uh, now if DACA were to end, uh, what would happen to them? What do you believe should happen to them? Well, in, in terms of my position in DACA, there's a process outside of DACA for people who come here and are human trafficked. We have different types of visas, um, and 
they, you know, many of these individuals may have qualified for those uh, visas. But let's back up to what Obama did when he instated DACA. Okay, he he did it. I don't know if you call it by fiat. Uh, he basically just went out on his own, and he worked with um, an, a U.S. Um, department here, and he just made that happen. Uh, it, it's DACA is there. Individuals have been given a window to apply. Those who qualify, if they've applied, if they've qualified. We need to look at what, why, when, where, how for those people. When I say I want to end DACA, I want to end it. Uh, I really, we have to say that we're going to be strong on immigration. If you were trafficked here, if you were brought here against your will, you need to report to somebody. You need to, you know, take action and figure out what you're going to do. Uh, because for yourself, especially those who were, you know, had come here as children and now are adults, uh, I, I think, and I view this this immigration situation as a kick the can situation, um, and it's not a Democrat or Republican. Pro, you know, issue. Both sides have taken part in kicking the can in their own way for a long time before President Donald Trump. So I would like to go into the United States Senate and close loopholes on immigration, close H-1B loopholes, close loopholes from uh, F to J to H-1 to permanent residency. We need to really tighten up immigration, lower the caps. We definitely need a wall put up. We also need infrastructure, manpower, and technology at the border. We also need enforcement within our borders uh, and to pressure states like California to follow federal immigration law. I'm fully in support of President Donald Trump and the Department of Justice in taking action against the state of California. And I'm also in support of all of the cities fighting back against SB 54. It's important to recognize if you go to move and end DACA, allow maybe the individuals who followed process to follow a process, but those who haven't applied and DACA, take the actions you need to take. You have to have other safeguards in place to make sure that we have stability. National security is a number one and top priority, okay? And, and it's very serious. It's not just, I don't like immigrants or migrants or illegals or DACA or children who've come here. It, that's not what this is. This is about laws. We are a land of laws. We have processes we have to follow in as um, citizens and also as, as leaders, we have to do the right thing and make the right and hard choices. And currently our Congress and United States Senate are not doing that. And I, I want to support our president. Well, where, where are you willing to compromise in, in some ways on, on immigration? I mean, there was a, a bill in Congress. Uh, I've heard for decades of, of both sides saying, oh, we want to we want to have immigration as top priority. Immigration is top priority. When the Tea Party took over the House in, in 2012, uh, right. that was supposed to be their first thing. But the first thing was the Keystone Pipeline. Now, uh, the Congress did get a bill and, uh, of course, it didn't get passed. And there was government shutdown, I mean, over over amnesty. It's so I think I think o I think Obama did have to do something in order to in order to get something done and now um it seems like a daca for a wall would be a compromise that you know some uh, definitely some uh democrats have come to the table with well and and i i believe that donald trump is a very good chess player right he he said you know hey we can do this if you do this you know daca for the wall what he was saying is, we need things in place. We need, uh, we need to have that stability. We need that sure thing that's going to stop the flooding, stop the continual drip uh, that that's that's happening with immigration uh, before we just unilaterally moved and, and you know to uh, to approve DACA for all. This is the deal is that some individuals have been given information. They have applied for statuses. They have moved forward. They've taken the step to do the right thing. 
should those persons be completely thrown to the back of the taken out of the country and thrown to the back of the line? Yeah. Uh, what action is are the, okay? What action are the Democrats actually willing to come to the table for? We saw very clearly they were not even willing to come to the table for what Donald Trump gave them. Uh, now, one of the issues that I, that I've been talking with people about is that perhaps we're putting too much on one plate. Perhaps we need to go about this and do what the Democrats do and very slowly chisel. Chisel, 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 um, or repair, 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 plug uh, loopholes. Systematically move forward to to make some changes uh, that need to be made, rather than trying to lump it all in one place and and buy this senator or buy this this House representative. You know, the American people. This is a fact. The American people are the ones who are being ripped off and. The DACA recipients uh, or uh, applicants are the ones being used as pawns. Something needs to be done for everyone in the picture because individuals who can't stay here because they haven't applied for a status and basically under federal immigration law who need to be moved out of this country, they need, they need action in their lives to go to that space and start their life over where they they were originally supposed to start their life to begin with, yes? Well, so, but, but, you know, but, but something has to be done. And, and if it means changing one small thing at a time, something is better than nothing. Because right now what we've seen is nothing. Well, you say that they should go back to where, you know, where they should be. I mean, fait accompli is that they are here. They are contributing members of the society here. So is well, that... Well, on how they came here, remember? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's important to recognize, I mean, are you talking about strictly those people who fall under DACA? Generally, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Generally or mm -hmm. yes? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's something where... Why haven't they applied for a status? If they've applied for a status, then let's deal with the situation and let's take a look. If they haven't applied for a status, why haven't they? Well, I think many have applied for a status and there's just, it just hasn't happened. I just, um, I, I'd like to take a measure of the, because we just, you just came out of the convention and yes. I think what, what one of the themes was, was immigration. Mm -hmm. So. And, and people who want to understand where the Republican Party is now, is it uh, an anti-immigrant party? Is it an anti-trade party? Well, I think it's important you distinguish whether or not you're talking about anti-legal immigrant or anti-illegal immigrant. Okay. There's a very, very strong difference between the two. Mm -hmm. One is breaking laws and one is following laws. Yeah, I guess specifically what amnesty. What talking about here is the DACA situation where you have people who are human trafficked here, either by their family members or, or otherwise, uh, who are put in precarious situations um, and, and should be going through a process. I guess specifically amnesty, because a, a lot of older Latino Americans I know, they, they love Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan gave uh, amnesty to a lot of their families, and they have been staunch Republican voters since, uh, loyal Republican voters since, for, for basically the, the policy that Ronald Reagan pushed for them. And um, and still hard to get them off that that voting block. Some of them, you know, agree that there are some measures needed. Um, however, when you look at Ted Cruz or or some other people who really stick to the amnesty issue as uh, a line that a line in the sand, um, is is that kind of how the party's moving now? Is well, I'm not speaking for the party. I'm speaking for Aaron Cruz for U.S. Senate. Right. The party itself has a platform that you can look at, uh, and certainly there are politicians or people who've been within the party or in a position of power within the party or been, um, you know, in elected positions and have made certain decisions like Ronald Reagan did. Ronald Reagan made a, made a very um, important decision at that moment in time. Unfortunately, the decisions that followed were not strong and left us to the place where we are today. And I believe that Donald Trump was very smart in what he was trying to accomplish with the United States Congress and the US Senate. What he was saying is, we're not taking any action 
with respect to DACA until we know that we're going to have an end game, a solution. So we don't continue to have this situation come up because like you said, uh, we have we have Ronald Reagan, one of the most prolific and, and memorable, of course, for my life, the most memorable presidents, and, and he was also a governor of all time. Um, and, and he did. He moved forward with amnesty for a good deal of people. Are we going to have to continually do this over and over and over again? Are we going to be a population where suddenly now we are not a nation of laws? Uh, and we allow people to come here that are not obeying laws and 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 abuse laws and uh, you know I, I can go I can go on and on and on but the party stands where the party stands and they're they are very clear where I stand I'll separate that I do not believe in blanket amnesty I've been I've been straightforward on this um, I have seen too many individuals come to this country legally many are on lists five, ten years long who want to come here. They want to come here legally to have people abuse the system. And, you know, unfortunately, children who are trafficked here or brought here, they're victims. Uh, but we can't allow their parents' choices uh, to, to put us in a position where now we're having to fund many, many, many different types of programs. And so the big picture would be this. If any action is going to be taken, I believe we need to do what Donald Trump talked about. We need to close the loopholes. We need to fund the border wall. We have to fund the infrastructure technology and uh, make sure that manpower is there. And, and the communication within the United States and, and those officials in ICE are able to do their jobs. Then we can take a look at what really needs to be done. Um, you know, it, we are a nation of laws. Yeah. If we aren't, then what do we come down to as a whole? Many of the individuals, like my family, who is who came here, half of them from Austria, they escaped the Holocaust. It was religious per persecution at its worst. And many individuals who flee here to this country to come here legally, they come from horrific situations. And many people who come here seeking refuge, they come from horrible, horrible situations. But those countries they're fleeing with are corrupt. They're filled with people who break laws. We need to remain a nation of laws of strength. And, and I believe that if we all work together, we'll be able to come up to a good solution for everyone. But we just, we have to get people to look at the big picture and, and take action one piece at a time. And you so, want to follow, you want to follow Donald Trump's policies and 25, 25 senators and congressmen have, have resigned and aren't seeking reelection. And, um, historically one of the members is, is the speaker of the house of representatives, Paul Ryan. Um, and he's, he's talked about not using identity politics or different, different things of, is he would like to see that. And he would like to see, we have John Kasich talking about running. He's, he's now resigning his governorship. Is this Trump's party now uh, coming out of the convention? Because you saw John Cox take some heat for not voting for Trump in the primary. And if, well, if, if so, what you're, what you're mentioning is Trump's party. We have to, I would take a, a deep breath, stand up, step back. Donald Trump has only been president just over a year. Many of these people have been players for a decade more. If you go back before their House run or their Senate run, they've been in this a long time. Uh, the corruption is deep. Is that Trump's party or is that the party that's been serving the American people for maybe decades, uh, some of them? And we're all in a position where, where we've been at these people's mercy. It doesn't even matter if it's Republican or Democrat. Uh, they, we're 20 trillion in debt. And, you know, when I when I saw we first it was let's take the House Republicans. OK, now it's let's take the Senate Republicans. And now it's let's take the presidency Republicans. The situation is this. I believe that the corruption is deep and it's not just the Democrats and it's not just Republicans. It's it's the leadership that's embedded within Washington, D.C. Well, let's talk about that, Aaron, because, uh, you know, you you and again, I, I want to make sure I have this right uh, from your bio. You, you consider yourself uh, aligned with the Tea Party. 
um, as as a, a very uh, almost a libertarian leaning conservative, I think we could say. So, how do you feel about those more I mainstream? Would, rep- I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would say more of an old time libertarian. Okay. The definitions. Well, how do you feel about um, not to get hung up on the on the definitions too much? But I mean, how do you feel about what we would consider maybe the more mainstream Republicans, like the Mitch McConnells of the world or the Lindsey Graham's? I mean, are they are they hurting or are they helping from your perspective the political conversation? So, where you're talking, you're saying that Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell are mainstream. I would say they would be considered more mainstream Republicans, sure, or moderate. Well, I mean, I guess one and the same. Well, do you do you think they're? I mean, do you consider them what moderates or mainstream, or, or is there a difference in your mind? I'm I stunned over that, here. <laughs> um, Mitch McConnell and um, Mitch McConnell specifically yeah. is undermining our presidency, and he, I would say, is not a moderate even. He's probably leaning left on a lot of issues. Uh, and he's not serving the party, especially when it comes to the policies and the stances which they said that they were initially going to take. And that's a concern. I mean, uh, how much of that is, is his role uh, within the Senate as leader of, of the party in the Senate? I mean, do you think he's trying to moderate the wings of the party as a true moderate would be? Uh, or is he, do you think, is he intentionally pulling the party to the left for some other reason? Well, that is a very good question. I, which one, which I will not know until I'm in the United States Senate. I'm sure uh, there is a lot that's going on behind the scenes. But for a good example to you to to kind of envision, and you maybe and your viewers can kind of go back and look at this. I recall not that long ago, I was on a hike and I was actually watching. Uh, uh, I guess if you would call it a C-SPAN or as an interview of Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. And it was the interview where Donald Trump was talking about how he wanted tax reform before Thanksgiving. And Mitch McConnell was standing right next to him and he's going, well, no, no, you know, and Donald Trump is saying, well, yes, we need to have tax reform. And McConnell was saying, well, you know, it probably won't happen. Look, these are people who in the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell, all of these individuals are here to serve the United States taxpayer. They're here to serve us and to take action. If the tax code isn't serving the populace, if it's inappropriate, if it needs to be reformed, it should not take 30 years. And for Mitch McConnell to sit there and undermine our president, he should have stood there and said, well, we are working on it. We are going to do our best to meet the president's desired timeline. Well, maybe he, I mean, but there are a lot of, you say, taxpayers in the United States who have a variety of different different viewpoints on that. I mean, he, right. McConnell well, he, is trying to navigate. It's been 30 years since any tax reform had been done. This was mm-hmm. something that they had been working on for quite some time. At what point is anyone on, on the Democrat or the Republican side of, of sanity and common sense going to say, hey guys, stop kicking the can and start serving the public. Uh, You know, let's take a look. This X, Y, Z isn't working. Let's make some, you know, reform and see how this goes. Um, and, And I do understand that they had been working on this package for quite some time. And it was a it was a posturing. If you watch Mitch McConnell, if you watch how President Trump was addressing the people. And you watch Mitch McConnell, it's very clear it went far past serving the populace because if he were serving the populace, he could have been very succinct and come across as such. He wasn't. He was very much um, upset with more with what Donald Trump was trying to communicate and wanting to accomplish. Uh, and, And to me, that's not working in favor of the American people because the fact is that we elected Donald Trump. And so he should be trying to work towards the position of working for and with the president for and with uh, the support of, of the American people and get stuff done. Well, how much of the Freedom Caucus have have some play in this? I mean, it seems like every time Mitch makes a deal with the Democrats. The Freedom Caucus comes in and says, he draws a line in the sand and says, no, it, it has to meet all these parameters, and the deal gets squashed. 
or uh, you know, and even Trump has been a little bit upset with the Freedom Caucus uh, for for some of the tactics there of the deal not being good good enough. Well, when is a deal good enough? Well, when it's agreed upon, I mean. People in the way that it should serve the American people. We are twenty trillion dollars in debt, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, we have a situation where amnesty is, is now on the table. Uh, we have a border, infl- you know, a border, basically a border war. We're having people, caravans, come and, and camp at our border. We have all of these issues. You know, what point do we stop and say, "Hey, this pot has been brewing for a very long time." And it's time to look to see what's going on there and, you know, look at that bigger picture. And certainly the Democrats have made it very clear that there are many of them, or shall I say most of them, are, are not in a position where they want to compromise. And, and that's not serving the American people either. Uh, and in the Freedom Caucus... They're the Freedom Caucus. They're they're playing their function in in government, just as many other caucuses do. Uh, and and so, well, you that, know, McConnell and his relation to to the Senate. I mean, the Senate is far more left leaning than than probably the president would like. Um, and, and probably much of what you're seeing in the immigration, in the tax reform, and otherwise, is probably also maybe the heat that's getting turned up from the the United States Senate not doing its job to work forward and push forth the nominations uh, that that President Trump has, has suggested that he needs for these different offices. I think it was 60% of the people he needs in those positions have not, those positions have not uh, been put through. And he needs that in order to, to, to do his job and be effective. And, and we need that as a people to make sure that our, our government is working efficiently. And and so it's kind of like that pressure cooker. It's it's something where these people who are up in D.C., and this is one reason why I'm running, is these people up in D.C., they're not serving the American public. And, and here in California, okay, I am a conservative. I'm a constitutional conservative. But the fact of the matter is there are a lot of not progressive, actual Uh, centrist Democrats who would support my candidacy and say they do support my candidacy because they are tired of the corruption. They want somebody who will listen, listen to them and, and hear what they have to say, as long as it makes good business sense, as long as it's, it's found in the United States constitution to get the job done. And, and yes, I would be serving a great deal of California who is not Republican, uh, and and but that would be my duty is to serve the people. Well, let's let's and that's what Congress and and the Senate is not doing right now. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the purpose of government, about about small government, which of course is is a common refrain. Many many on the on the right want smaller government, and and I mean certainly many people across the political spectrum can see some of the purpose for that. I mean, I think back to you know, the days of Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. I mean, they would make deals and Tip would fight very hard to, to maintain as much spending as possible. And Reagan wanted to cut as much as possible and have tax cuts, which of course he did have. Um, but I mean, there's, there's a balance there. I mean, I think that many of us who, who do consider themselves more centrist can admit, right. okay, there's some, there's, some, there's some logic in having a smaller government, less waste, but you need social safety nets. You need to help people who need help. You need to protect security people. Security is a top priority. So, and, and I, I know, I understand, but what I'm saying is people's security are more than, is more than just military. I mean, there's security they have with food security, healthcare security. There's things that we need as people in the country. So is it possible to cut too much is my question. At this point? Mm-hmm. We have a lot of waste. Well, like what is, is SNAP waste in your in your mind? It depends on actually how you define SNAP and who is receiving SNAP. I do believe that within SNAP there is a great deal of waste, uh, abuse, and fraud. And so when I say crush corruption in my platform, that would go across the board, uh, across the board to crushing corruption and reducing waste in terms of fraud. Uh, in terms of inappropriate uh, use by people who are uh, not legally here uh, and, and otherwise. Uh, there are people who are on SNAP who need a hand up. They aren't taking this for a handout. There's a big difference, and it was put there for a purpose. Yeah, and uh, we just saw today that, well, and this is going to get 
recorded in the future and there's a couple things coming down or we're going to air this in the future future, Mm -hmm. and uh of course tomorrow is the big deadline for for trump to speak on the iran issue Mm -hmm. but today he's he's also asking that 15 billion be cut out of the of the budget that's already been done and signed and one of those things he wants cut out is the uh children's health insurance program something that got a got a lot of uh pushback um you know bipartisan pushback bipartisan pushback Mm -hmm. um when we talk about those sort of things, but in the new farm bill, we see that there is loads of money available for for wealthy farmers. In fact, uh, what is it? Um, uh, Sixty thousand farms takes over forty percent of the farm bill subsidies. subsidies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when we when we look at that corruption and that some of those things, I mean, where is it do, that we want to cut? Do we want to allow nieces, nephews, and 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 cousins to to have access to? Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in farm subsidies when they do not work on a farm or never lifted a finger on the farm? Or do we want to give that money to children's health insurance program? It's unclear. I I mean, I've read a lot of policy, but it's unclear to me where some of this information is coming from. For example, when we look at the omnibus bill, this giant, ginormous, bloated omnibus bill that, that came through, who wrote most of that? Lobbyists. So the question would be, why is some of, or why are some of these initiatives being funded? What is the purpose? What is their role? How much of it is waste? How much it is, you know, how much of it is uh, part of that lobby arm? Uh, and and what is essential? to serve the American people in the best and most appropriate way possible. And for me to just weigh in unilaterally and just tell you, oh no, we need to fund this, we need to fund that, I'm not in the United States Senate and I don't know what's going on in the back rooms. Mm -hmm. I know that they make deals, I know they lump bills. Uh, I would like to get rid of what we call piggybacking because what they do is they write a bill and then they stuff something in the bill that, that, you know, uh, somebody's pet project, whatever it might be. I would like the American people to be served with clean bills that they can they can read and understand and, and know really what's been going on. The lobbyists have taken far more control than they should be able to be allowed to have. Uh, and, and we're ending up in a position where we're wondering, well, wait, why aren't we feeding our children? Why are we subsidizing farms? Uh, you know, it's there are a lot of questions there and and some of which I can't just give you the answer right now um, and but the one thing I do know is that these lobbyists hold a lot of weight why are our farms suffering why do they need subsidy you know this is a Americans um, vitalization you know right there is is their ability to feed their family. Um, I, I look at the farmers in the Central Valley here in, in California who can't get the water they need to grow food. Okay, food. It's not wasting water. It's growing food for the American people. Uh, and so it, just the whole big picture of what we see is distorted right now. What I would like to know is what's really going on in the back rooms, what's mm-hmm. going on in the, in the United States Senate and, and, and in the certain areas and really see and understand what that lobby is because it's it's i believe there's a lot more than you and i actually know about i guess i guess and i i, I kind of asked my question wrong but I, thank you for for that was a very good answer for for that i guess what i'm saying if you, if you have somebody that comes to you and makes a deal and you get take the deal but then a couple weeks later they come back and they want to do the deal again. Mm-hmm. And we're not only seeing this in the House of Representatives, we're seeing this in the Iran deal. And we're seeing this in, in China. We're gonna we're gonna have tariffs. Then the next day we're not. Then the next day we're gonna have tariffs on Mexico. Then the Wait, next day we're not. Yeah. At what yeah. point do we become a, a, a discredited broker? Uh, and I like Trump's style. He likes to put out the balloon as James as as the and and kind of try to work for the best deal. Know about, okay, and, and this is why won't hear me talking about Syria. You won't hear me talking about war, or or the kinetic activity, as Obama loved to call, call it, kinetic activity. Uh, that's been going on around the globe because there are certain elements that we, you and me, we just are not privy to. 
doesn't matter how many news articles you read. It doesn't matter where your news source is. If you read every single one, I'm going to tell you, you are not getting the whole story. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I going to tell you that this is why I do not weigh in on some of those issues because I believe there's a lot that the American people just are not aware of and and this is one, another reason why I'm running for US Senate because the people deserve to be represented to have an actual voice and to know what's been going on and I have to tell you what we see probably with Donald Trump is indicative of what's going on out there and that he's doing his best job to mitigate whatever it is that's going on that maybe we don't know about and to offer us the best solutions and it may look like you know discredited broker or at one point do you know you said at what point do we become a discredited broker but at what point don't we start and stop start and stop fighting for what is good and right for the American people because when America benefits the world benefits uh, is really what it comes down to. And we have to safeguard uh, our processes, our, our policies, our, our laws. And that's, I believe, what Trump is trying to work forward and do. And unfortunately, I don't think that that had been done very graciously through um, the Obama presidency. It was leading, many people called it leading from behind. Uh, but really, I see it as bad deals were made which undermined our, our, our nation and our populace and, and the U.S. taxpayer. So Trump is trying to help, um, I guess, cure the equilibrium and bring us on, on target and on base. And it's not going to be comfortable. Well, and, but I mean, the converse that you say there is true as well. I think that you're right. When America does well, the world does well. But when the world does well, America does well also. It's an interrelated system. Right. But when you're working from an, a position of... Um, regulatory abuse where we're, you know, we have, for example, here in California, we have OSHA, okay, uh, for safety and regulation. Uh, we have Cal OSHA, which goes many steps further for regulatory, you know, regulations. Um, and I have to say that in many other countries, they don't have the types of regulations that we have and, and their costs are far, far lower. Um, and sure, we are able to buy things far cheaper, but there, there's, you know, I remember an echo when Obama said we need to even, or how did he say it? We need to level the playing field. Well, I've now heard President Donald Trump use that same saying, we need to level the playing field because America have been, you know, Americans have been cut short in, in a lot of cases. And in some of these large countries like China um, have, have been abusing the process and, and taking advantage. And so is it bad for us to want equality? And speaking, speaking of that, it's <clears throat> this is the first president we've seen who has attacked a former office. We haven't seen it uh from from the presidential office. Now, what I hear from Trump tr Trump fans and what I hear from just Republicans who, who find themselves in a little different spot is that you you got to have respect for the office. And I remember early on in the Bush years, I was highly critical of of George Bush and um I was told I was not pa not a patriot. I was told I was un-American. But apparently that went away under 8 years in Obama and now it's still uh, uh, it seems like a group that wants to have respect for the office, but however, wants to constantly blame the, the previous administration. And how, right. do, how are I, I would like to see Donald Trump be able to to unify this country. I'd like to see him be able to get past these 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 uh, boutique arguments uh, about crowd size and, and different things and and and, and you know, vote, voting uh, electoral college votes and all these different things. And and move on past this administration. It, it, is that not going to be possible? Because it seems like the message from some of the Republicans is, yeah, uh, you know, unemployment's at 4.1 percent. We're doing great. But let's not give the previous administration any credit for that. And let's continue to look at things from this prism of the previous administration was bad. Is that unpatriotic? Is that un-American? Well, I think 
I think what's important here is we move forward and take a look at what we can still do better. I still, I believe that we need further tax reform. I believe that with strong borders and immigration, we'll do even better when we have strong borders, strong national security, our economy flourishes as well. Uh, you know, let's keep moving forward. Let's start, you know, stop kicking the can and start taking action. And, and the fringe issues, they're noise. Uh, let go of the noise, drown it out, move forward, and let's get work done. That's how I view it. Um, it's it, the tick and tack has to stop. Um, and and you know I, I've watched Hillary go on her po you know crying tour about why she still still why she had didn't win. And it, at what point do you say, hey Hillary, how do we make America wonderful? How do we move forward in America? Oh, well, we just lost Erin. We didn't intentionally lose Erin. We, we lost her accidentally. We, she, it wasn't because she was abusing Hillary Clinton that we just lost lost Erin. But we'll, we'll, we'll get her back here in a moment. But it's interesting, Erin, you know, that we're talking about these these issues with with Erin. Of course, Erin's a, a pretty conservative uh, uh, Republican. But I mean, the divide, I think, is really interesting. You and I are both obviously a lot more left than she is. You're lefter than I am. I think you try to bridge these things and try to figure out how you're going to be able to find common ground. I mean, I think that there are some things we, we, we can agree on here, but there's a lot more that we don't agree with her about, I think. Would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, it's, you know, the California Republican um, Tea Party person is an interesting one because they want following for their for their president and they want respect for the office. Mm -hmm. However, they are the resist movement in mm -hmm. in the state. Yeah. Eric, do we have you back? Okay. We lost you. Sorry, well, we you did know, not we did not hang we, up. We we were we were vamping for a few minutes while we were waiting for you. But I want to ask you this question because we do have a few more minutes, so hopefully you can spend a couple yeah. more minutes with us. Um, but in the couple minutes we have left, I wanted to ask you a, a, a quick uh, a quick issue yeah, that I'm I know we can <laughs> well, but I want to ask you about a quick issue in the five minutes we have left, and I'm sure we can solve, and that's healthcare. I'm sure we can solve that in five minutes, right? Um, yeah. so. <laughs> no, that's, that's a, it's a really complex question, I'm sure, but we'll, well, let me, we'll try to fit it in five minutes. Let, let's, let's just, just to get it framed. So um, give me the argument for the, the market-based solution to, to healthcare, the health healthcare problem that we're having in this country that we've had for a while, as opposed to, say, a uh, either single-payer approach or more of a blended approach uh, that, you know, kind of creates, you know, blends some subsidies and pricing controls along with the market. What, what's the argument for a pure well, market-based solution? What I would like solution? to see, what I would like to see would be, uh, you know, the ability to purchase insurance across state lines. What I would also like to see is tort reform, of, you know, free market solutions um, put in place where, you know, what, and I have to mention this because this, this is the part that kind of blows people's minds. What do we want for America? What do we want to be government health care at its best? Look at the VA. Okay? Do we want that for everybody? Because it sure, sir, is not serving our veterans appropriately. What I would like to see is even for veterans to be able to use our free market solutions and open health care programs and have access to care outside of the VA um, and and be in a position where there are there are options. You know, as we've seen with Obamacare, affordable health care is, is like, it's fake. Um, you know, it, their Affordable Care Act was, you know, so everybody would have insurance. Insurance does not mean quality care, does not mean affordable care. Uh, you know, I believe that we have to look at the big picture, make, uh, make insurance uh, competitive. I know people who, who have, for example, plug your ears, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't want to hear something. Um, I know people who are paying for birth control coverages when they don't need birth control coverages, men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and why are they, you know, forced under some Obamacare um, regimens to, to be able, you know, to, to pay for those coverages. We have to open up insurance to be 
in a position where it serves all of the populace and not everybody may need the same kind of coverages. And there may be some individuals who need more coverage than others. There may be people who have pre-existing conditions um, that they could or ha maybe they couldn't have prevented uh, that need extra coverage. Um, and of course, you want to make sure that there, you know, discrimination and um, disqualification uh, by insurance abuse and other things uh, is taken care of as well. I get we need infrastructure in our health system, but remember, gentlemen, more government is not necessarily the answer. Uh, and I believe that if we can let the free market work alongside of the structures of government and find a good balance that maybe in one or two revisions of health reform that we might be able to be in a place where we're seeing the market, health market, be able to work for Americans again. Uh, premiums decrease, uh, deductibles decrease, and um, see some more innovation in our health system. And that would be a positive improvement. But again, I don't think there is any quick fix. I would like to see some, uh, I would like to see the repeal of Obamacare I would like to see uh, some provisions put in place, maybe for safeguarding of insurance abuse and overstep. Uh, but other well, than that, you're, I think you're dating our show. You're dating our show way back. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Obamacare was a bipartisan bill. It went through all the committees, all the all the bipartisanness. It was a Romney Romney Maryland bill. Not one Republican voted for it. Uh, it, it it passed the Senate. It passed all all the stuff. Now they and did they did up. they did have Republicans on those committees, and they did go to Republicans as part uh, of the deal. Voted for it. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the deal the deal that did not pass that the Republicans <laughs> the Republicans can take care of uh, credit for the deal that did not pass. They worked solely in the back room only with themselves and and didn't even let Democrats, they didn't even take it to committee. And that, that deal fell through. If you get into the Senate and we try health care again, will you allow Democrats a seat to at the table? Will, will you allow Democrats a seat at the table on a health care bill? All parties should have a seat at the table and they need to start serving the American public. That's what it comes down to, is they have to serve the American people and, and, and the public. Social, uh, socialism never worked. Free market works. How does government have a role? Let's look at what's balanced, what's right, what's equitable for the American people, for the taxpayer, and and let's get something done. What we're seeing right now is kicking the can again. It's well, gotta stop. But I mean, but but just to be just to put a point on it, I mean, we can't have a healthcare system where people in this country can be as healthy as they can afford to be. I mean, there needs to be some level, and you mentioned it. I think I, I give you credit for that. That there is a, a level of government involvement that you need to have there. Well, you can't have insurance companies, you know, abusing the system, or you know, a, a situation where. Um, doctors are, are abusing the system right now. We need tort reform because there are all sorts of crazy lawsuits going on. You know, there there has to be some level of safeguard there. But what's the balance? Yeah. Well, Aaron Cruz, wow. Thank you so much for coming on our show. I yeah. really appreciate it. We had a good time with you. Yeah. Thank you for having that discussion. With really us good today. guest. Yes, yes. And I'd be glad to have it any time. Yeah, you, 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 you were great. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, that's our show for today, guys. Thanks uh, again for Aaron Cruz for joining us on the show. Uh, don't forget, NorCal News Now is available wherever you download your podcast. So check us out and subscribe. Uh, we can also be found on Facebook at NorCal News Now, where you can post your comments and suggestions for upcoming podcast topics and guests. So thanks to all of you for listening in. We'll be back at you soon with another episode of NorCal News Now. So long.